Okay, now this is actually an annotation video for Act 4, Scene 3. We're actually just going to skip over Scene 2 because there's not a huge amount here to annotate and I'd like you to practice some independent annotation. Instead of me giving you all the annotations here, this is a moment where um, Capulet is talking to the people who work in his household and the nurse about the final preparations for the marriage. I want you to look out for any evidence of patriarchy, any evidence of his control over his daughter, the idea that he sees her as an object to be given away, um, the idea that he, he requires obedience from her, the things that he calls her, um, the way he references the marriage, etc. But that's something I'd like you to do a bit more independently. If we skip on then to page 95, we're going to pick up on scene three. So it's Tuesday night in Juliet's bedroom. This is the moment where Juliet is frightened to take the drug that the friar has given her. She's having kind of second thoughts. So this is the moment that she bids goodnight to her mother and then sits contemplating the reality of what she's doing. Aye, those attires are best, but gentle nurse, I pray thee, leave me to myself tonight, for I have need of many orisons to move the heavens to smile upon my state, which well thou knowest is cross and full of sin. So she's saying to, to the nurse, yes, I like those clothes, those clothes will be good, um, but I've got many prayers, orisons means prayers, so I've got many prayers that I need to, I need to say tonight for forgiveness. Um, and when she says to move the heavens to smile upon my state, again, celestial imagery, there, heavens, and the personification of the heavens, is a reference to fate and fatalism. She's willing her fate to be kind to her. She's, she's aware that her fate needs to change and that um, that wheel has turned and her fate has become um, negative and, and she's, she's in a place of, of darkness and unpleasantness. So she's hoping that her, her destiny effectively will change. Enter Lady Capula. What are you busy, home? Need my help? Need you my help? No, madam, we have culled such, ne such necessaries as are behoveful to our state tomorrow, tomorrow. So please you, let me now be left alone, and let the nurse this night sit up with you, for I am sure you all have your hands full in this so sudden business. Good night, get thee to bed and rest, for thou hast need. And the nurse and Lady Capulet leave. And then we enter into Juliet's soliloquy. Now her soliloquy, remember, it's something that's spoken aloud for the benefit only of the audience, um, and so we hear Juliet's inner monologue, her inner emotions at this moment where she's about to take the, the vial of poison. And it's a moment of real turmoil, of kind of fear and uncertainty as she kind of veers back and forth between the brave need to take the potion and the fear about uh, the poison and the fear about what it might do and the consequences. Farewell, God knows when we shall meet again. I have a faint cold fear thrills through my veins that almost freezes up the heat of life. I'll call them back again to comfort me. Nurse! What should she do here? My dismal scene I needs must act alone. Come, vile. What if this mixture do not work at all? Shall I be married then tomorrow morning? No, no, this shall forbid it. Lie thou there. So she even gets a dagger ready just in case the potion does not make her appear dead by the morning. She's kind of preparing her other options so she does not have to marry Paris. What if it be a poison which the friar subtly hath ministered to have me dead? Lest in this marriage he should be dishonoured because he married me before to Romeo. So she worries about some ulterior motive from the friar here. Possibly the friar has laced it with poison to save his own reputation. I fear it is, and yet methinks it should not, for he hath still been tried a holy man. So she kind of reminds herself, hold on, the friar is, is, a, is a priest, he's a friar, he's a holy man, he's not going to murder me. Um, how if, when I am laid in the tomb, I wake before the time that Romeo come to redeem me? That's a fearful point. I shall, shall I not then be stifled in the vault, to whose foul mouth no healthsome air breathes in, and there die strangled ere my Romeo comes? Or if I live, is it not very like the horrible conceit of death and night, together with the terror of the place, as in a vault, an ancient receptacle? While for this many hundred years the bones of all my buried ancestors are packed, where bloody Tybalt, yet but green in earth, lies festering in his shroud, where, as they say, at some hours in the night spirits resort. Alack, alack, it is not like that I. So she's thinking about the kind of terror of waking up in a tomb before she's rescued. 
And, you know, this reference here where she says, all my buried ancestors, reminds us again that imagery of family and identity and that these notions of betrayal. She's actually about to betray her family with what she's doing. And so we think about the idea of love being family heritage and honour. She's concerned about that. She doesn't want to hurt her family. Bloody Tybalt. And she also, of course, doesn't know where her um, loyalties lie, whether they do lie with the Capulets or with the Montagues, since her marriage to, to Romeo. She also uses this imagery of decay. Tybalt green in the earth lies festering. So that this kind of symbolises the wider corruption of their love. Their love is kind of rotten and impure now, and she's using this imagery of decay to show that. So early waking, what with loathsome smells and shrieks like mandrakes torn out of the earth, that living mortals hearing them run mad, or, if I wake, shall I not be distraught, environed with all these hideous fears, and madly play with the forefather's joints, and pluck the mangled Tybalt from his shroud, and in this rage with some great kinsman's bone as a club, dash out my desperate brain. So she says, if I woke up in that tomb, would I not be driven mad and do insane things, um, like pluck a bone from one of my forefathers and use it to dash my brains out? Oh, look! I think I see my cousin's ghost seeking out Romeo that did spit upon his body, upon a rapier's point. That did spit his body upon a rapier's point. Sorry. Stay, Tybalt, stay. Romeo, 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 here's drink. I drink to thee. And it ends with this apostrophe. Now, apostrophe is where you call out to a kind of absent person. It could be an object. It could be a feeling. You know, you might call out love, love, peace, peace. Um, and actually... Um, Earlier on in the text, when Juliet calls out to fortune, it's the same device. It's spelt the same way as apostrophe, as in the kind of dot you have before an S to indicate somebody possesses something, owns something. Um, the same kind of, of symbol, like if you had Romeo's love, Romeo apostrophe S. It's spelt the same way, A-P-O-S-T-R-O-P-H-E. But this is where we call out to somebody who is absent, could be an object, could be a feeling, could be anything like that. And this shows her dedication to Romeo, that it's him that she drinks to. It's his name that she calls out, even though he is absent in this moment. OK, now we're actually going to skip over scene four. I'll just tell you this now, because this is simply the preparation for the wedding. There is nothing worth annotating here. This is literally Capula ordering around the servants while they prepare for the wedding. There is no way you would get a... Um, an extract question on this section. But when we resume, you're going to resume on page 99 with Act 4, Scene 5. But if you would like to read Act 4, Scene 4, of course, you're more than welcome. But you're unlikely to find anything very rich in language. It is literally just capital preparing party. Okay, well done. So we'll pick up on Act 4, Scene 5 when you're ready. <laughs> 